Welcome to the Art of Procurement Podcast with your host, Philip Eidson. Here, thought leaders share the trends, strategies, and tactics that you can use to elevate the role of procurement and your career. Hi there, everybody, and welcome to today's Art of Procurement show. And I'll say it now, I'm an Olympic Games junkie, so the last week has been fantastic. Um, But in watching the opening ceremony in Rio last Friday, I was inspired to think about the role that procurement plays in the run-up to the Games. So I started doing some research. Um, I wanted to pull together a Friday show, a solo show. And I found a wealth of resources that were actually related to the London 2012 Games. And what I'll do is I'll actually link up to what I found in the show notes. But I thought, rather than cover this in my own show, why not try and go straight to the source? And so, um, rather hurriedly, it was late last week, I reached out to Jerry Walsh, and Jerry was the CPO for the London 2012 Games. Jerry said yes, and so I'm delighted to welcome him onto the show today. And Jerry really has enjoyed a long and a storied career. He climbed the corporate ladder at companies such as Ford Motor Company and Procter & Gamble, before becoming the head of procurement for American Express's European, Middle East, and Asia-Pacific business. And as well as LOCOG, which is how we refer to the London 2012 Games in the interview, it's actually short for the London Organising Committee of the Olympic and Paralympic Games. Jerry's also enjoyed CPO roles at companies such as Associated British Foods and Amy. He is a past SIPs president, and in 2012, he was awarded the SIPs Procurement and Supply Chain Management Professional of the Year for his role with the London 2012 Organising Committee. And so in today's show, we discussed the role that procurement plays in the delivery of the games, some of the unique challenges that his team faced, and the legacy that really ensures that Jerry and his team's work lives on not only in subsequent games, um, but also in other major global sporting events. Okay, well, before I go to the interview, let me share with you details of today's sponsor, and then I'm going to go straight into my discussion with Jerry. Today's episode of the Art of Procurement is brought to you by Zykus Horizon 2016. And Horizon is an annual conference hosted by Zykus. Zykus is a leading provider of a complete suite of source-to-pay procurement performance solutions. And their 2016 Horizon event is a three-day get-together of some of the most leading minds in the procurement space, where everybody gets together and shares and solves their most critical challenges with their peers. Um, The event itself is taking place in Arizona. And I'm thrilled that the Art of Procurement will be a media partner for Horizon, and I'm actually going to be hosting a main stage panel discussion as part of the event. So to find out more, visit artofprocurement.com slash horizon. That's artofprocurement.com slash horizon. So hi there, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Art of Procurement. And I'm very fortunate today to be joined by Jerry Walsh. Jerry, welcome to the show. Thanks, Phil. Well, um, I talked a little bit about your background in my introduction, um, but I'm interested to know, and this is a question that I often ask guests who have been in and around procurement for a long time, you know, did you seek procurement or did it seek you? Uh, yes, yeah, a good, good question. Actually, uh, I sought procurement. Right. Uh, and I guess I'm one of those uh, few who um, actually started off their careers in procurement and the background to that was when I was at uh, university uh, in my final year, I took some uh, personality tests. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what that personality uh, profile taught me was that there were certain occupations that would be more uh, relevant to me than others. I did a general business degree mm-hmm. with honours at uh, Queen's University in Belfast. And the careers people there were uh, were very, very hot on making sure that their students had a good opportunity to find uh, work uh, after um, uh, they left university. So uh, one of the uh, occupations that came up, one of the careers that came up was the supply chain. And um, with that, I looked at uh, a number of organizations, one of them being Ford Motor Company, and I was really impressed with what they offered in their um, program for um, uh, for graduate trainees. So uh, anyway, the rest is history. I joined Ford Motor Company as a graduate trainee in the um, supply function and uh, and never really looked back. Um, I've been in the, um, the function now for over 30 years and uh, um, I actually made the deliberate decision many years ago not to um, to move into general management because... Uh, 
I always just felt passionate about supply function. So uh, that's the background. Well, it's funny that you said you joined Ford. So that was exactly the same route that I took. I didn't know that you did that. So I joined Ford as well on their graduate scheme um, with a BA degree in business, in general business. And um, yes. placed in procurement. And at the time, I had no clue what procurement was. And I thought, it's just going to be a six-month rotation. I'll go into HR or marketing or something that, at the time, I thought sounded like it would be more interesting. Um, and then got the bug and stayed and never looked back, really. Um, just because, particularly in automotive, you know, purchasing had such a strong role to play in the organization. You just got to see so much of the things going on in the company that you probably wouldn't have in another area of the business at that point in your career. Indeed. Absolutely. And so what I wanted to talk about today is um, the role of procurement in delivering the Olympic Games and... Uh, you've got a very unique perspective and experience on that. So first of all, before I even ask any questions around that, I just wonder if you could share with listeners kind of your background in terms of um, procurement in the Olympics and as it relates to London 2012, the Games in London. Yes, I think um, in procurement at Olympic organizations historically, I think the role of procurement was probably um, much smaller in that uh, my understanding from working with the International Olympic Committee and the and indeed the International Paralympic Committee um, was that largely procurement was seen as a more of a transactional processing mm-hmm. area, i.e., an area that took the um, the specification and indeed often the the uh, choice of supplier from the uh, different functional areas, uh, different stakeholders, and then just placed the orders. Now, of course, there was some element of procurement involved in that and some element of negotiation, but largely it seemed to me to be more of a transaction processing type right. function um, in, the, in the in Olympic or, organizations and lead um, committees uh, prior to London. Uh, I think London took a very, very different approach, um, and that was right from the top of the organization, uh, from Lord Coe down through the organization for a variety of reasons. I think the first one was that... Um, we felt that we needed to get um, absolute best value from every pound that we were spending, pound sterling that we right. were spending. Um, and um, a number of reasons for that. A, budget constraints in 2012, um, whilst uh, the, the horrors of 2007 were, uh, um, were certainly um, not as um, uh, significant. Um, we were still facing the, um, the the backlog of issues that uh, 2007, 2008 recession had created, yeah. and hence um, our budgets were tight. Government uh, looked at uh, what we were doing, and um, and in terms of um, spending money, um, uh, the government view was that they wanted to spend as little as possible, and indeed they wanted to make sure there were no overspends. Important to understand also that low cog and laying on the limits was a private organization, not a government one. So we were funded through um, sponsorship, through ticketing, um, uh, merchandising, um, uh, and such like. We weren't getting government money. Okay. But there was a significant interface with government um, uh, around what it was that we were doing. And there were certain things that government requested that they did have to fund uh, because they weren't in our um, in our brief. And so there was a significant uh, engagement with the government bodies. But London, therefore, looked at it very, very commercially and were prepared to make very, very tough decisions in order to ensure that we did remain within budget. And um, in addition to, uh, to to budgetary requirements, it was also about that value and the definition of value. Mm-hmm. Where, uh, when you're delivering the games, there's an element of, whilst the price may be important, actually the fact that uh, the supplier needs to deliver the requirement for a supplier to deliver, that's even more important because you can get the right price, but if you don't get the right delivery, you can't put the Olympic Games right. back. So you've got that immovable date. Um, and also um, getting the right specification. Is the specification right? Because the eyes of the world are upon you, and therefore if you're going to deliver a substandard specification, it's going to become very, very visible mm-hmm. to a lot of people. You've got billions of people watching on television, and you've got 10 million spectators. I think in addition, part of our definition of value for money was around sustainability, and the things that we were doing, the products and services we were buying, were they sustainable? And also diversity and inclusion. We made a decision early on at London that 
we were going to set the standards in diversity inclusion within the supply chain. And um, we were very vocal and very visible in doing that. Uh, and therefore, when you set the standards, you, you do have to walk the talk. So we, we also um, built that into our decisioning process in delivering value for money and the nature of the tenders that were coming through and making our decisions as to who to award contracts to. We incorporated uh, all the, that wider definition of value for money in everything that we did. Yeah, I think also in London, um, important to say that uh, we had a central procurement function in terms of everything to, to, to my team, and we managed that centrally. However, we co-located our team members with the different functional areas so that whilst um, we had a team of over 30 people at the height of the procurement pro- workload, um, most of those people didn't sit centrally with me. They sat out with the individual right. functional areas to ensure that we had uh, really absolutely um, top quality relationships with those functionaries. We understood what it is that they wanted. Um, we under- They understood what it was that they needed to do to help us get those things. Um, so I think that uh, that working with stakeholders was also something that uh, was new to people, the, the way that we would operate. Because in Olympic Games, what you find in Paralympic Games, you find that um, there are lots of people who come in from previous games. Okay. They've got preconceived ideas of how you're going to do things, not just how you're going to do them, but also the suppliers they're going to use. And in our situation, we said, look, you just can't do that. Everything is going to be uh, put out to tender. We're going to have an open process so that um, we ensure that we get the best value for money rather than we've got a predetermined uh, notion of which suppliers we will use. Um, and that was a bit of a culture change for a lot of people. So uh, I think those are things that made London very, very different. Mm-hmm. And, and how did you change the hearts and minds of those people then in, when they're not really used to dealing with a centralized procurement or maybe any procurement strategically? What was it that you did that, that really helped them buy into the procurement process and the value that you could deliver them? Again, a very, very good question. Um, the um, first thing t- we did was got um, support right from the very, very top of the organization, from the executive and indeed from the board. Um, because without that, you just can't make these things happen. Um, so um, just shortly after I joined the organization, I presented to the executive committee and also to the board to outline how it was that we would uh, procure and why we needed to procure in that way. And when everyone considered the implications and understood the ramifications, um, uh, the view was that actually it made it made sense. What I mean by that is um, boards of organizations and executive teams are often going to find themselves in positions where suppliers and partners, sometimes indeed sponsors, are going to be uh, putting um, a particular pressure yeah. uh, to do things in a certain way or, or use their, their, their supply. And um, that puts the um, board members, executive members, senior people in your organization in a very difficult spot. By doing what we uh, we proposed to do, that took away that, uh, right. that issue and placed it firmly and squarely in a procurement function, a professional procurement function. Um, so it, ra- it re- mitigated the risk of um, uh, of deals being done outside a, a proper process. Right. Um, and that process we published. We published that on the um, uh, the local website so that everybody understood what what it was we were doing, why we were doing it, how we would do it, and therefore nobody could be compromised. And that worked incredibly well. Um, so um, I think. Um, getting the hearts and minds of the executive team and then those executive team members supporting us right. when um, we did find the odd uh, person who uh, wanted to bypass the um, the process, the procedures. Um, and I think the other thing that was important is that we also demonstrated a level of flexibility insofar as uh, you can have a tender process that can take six months, a year or, or longer. And sometimes you needed to have a truncated tender process, mm-hmm. but still... Um, not move away from the principles of a, a proper process. And by doing that and by turning things around really quickly at times, I think that helped people come on board with us and understand that we were working with the different functional areas. Remember, you're buying for lots of different people in a 
uh, um, Olympics and Paralympics organization. You're buying for sports. You're buying for ceremonies. You're buying for technology. Uh, you're buying for venues. You're buying for catering and equipment. You know, you, you, the list goes on. Um, there's so many different areas that you're buying yeah. for, and you really want to pull that together in a, in a cohesive way. So how did suppliers react? So are the suppliers used to dealing with the procurement process because they're just general contractors who happen to be bidding on the Olympic Games, or do contractors follow games around the world in so much as some of the folks involved in you know, building the infrastructure do? Yes, yeah, some some suppliers follow the the games around the world. It's true, and therefore our process, I think, was quite different um, for those people. But uh, we sat down, and explained it to them, and I think that's really important communication, mm-hmm. being clear about what you're doing, and making sure that uh, it's um, it's very transparent. I think it's uh, transparency in what we were doing was uh, of paramount importance to us. Um, a lot of suppliers are are local suppliers because a lot of the things that you're procuring. Um, you can't really buy internationally. Okay. Um, but of course, uh, some of the larger uh, ticket items um, were procured from international suppliers. And we were quite clear about that at the outset. We would go to the suppliers who offer, offer the best of value. Um, and therefore, that um, that meant that if it was an international supplier and on uk supplier, so be it. Um, if you went through a fair competition, then the winner... Um, uh, would would uh, become very clear, and uh, I think that process was respected by people, not like universally by everyone. You have various lobbies, people who want you to buy from UK, and that's very understandable. Um, you have got um, various trade bodies who uh, have got their vested interests. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. a, it's a challenge, and indeed. You know, so one of the things about working in an Olympics and Paralympic Games is the range of stakeholders that you have to work with is pretty much mind blowing, right. and it's um, it's working your way through that um, that is of absolute critical importance. Um, you can't ignore them, and uh, you've got to work with them. So the idea that you can sit in a cocoon and just get on with your job and ignore um, that wide range of stakeholders that just doesn't work. You really do need to embrace them, communicate with them. Which does take the extra time, yeah. but actually in, invest the time in that early on, and uh, it's time well spent. Yeah, and I guess you you mentioned before that LOCOG, the organizing committee, is a private enterprise, but the perception, I'm guessing, and, and this is my perception just as a um, you know UK citizen, is you just assume that LOCOG and anybody who's associated with the organizing committee is really a public body and that it's spending public funds, not private funds. So even though that's not the fact, you probably have to operate as if it is just because of the the scrutiny that you're under the microscope that you're under in spending money absolutely and uh, you need to respect the fact that uh, lots of people are going to have uh, divergent views as to what you're doing and uh, if you're a supplier who's bid for business at the olympics and you've been unsuccessful um you know certainly some suppliers are going to feel hard done by you know particularly yeah. if um the supplier that has been chosen is someone that uh, perhaps um, they weren't aware of so, so much historically and um, some of these new has come in and, uh, and won the business because their ability to uh, uh, talk to um, um, their other customer bases you know, that they've got one business at the uh, at the Olympics uh, is for them a massive massive marketing bonus uh, and hence many many people want to be associated with the Olympics right. and therefore they take it personally if uh, uh, they haven't won the tenders. And it's important to manage that communication back to the supplier base as to if they haven't been successful. Why is that? Uh, we did that. We spent a lot of time debriefing suppliers as to um, why they weren't successful and also helping them understand that if uh, there are future tender opportunities, how they could better place themselves mm-hmm. for the next uh, tender opportunity. When you were building your team, you said that you had a team of up to 30, I think, at its peak. Was it because of that, the nature of the games and um, the cachet of working for the games, was it easy to recruit folks to what is was always going to be a temporary um, or a time-limited assignment? Or did you have difficulty because, you know, people would be giving up careers that they may think are, um, you know, stable careers for something that only had a year or two-year lifespan on it? That's such a good question because um, uh, the answer is... Um, it, it wasn't easy to recruit right. um, 
because we were going out to recruit the best people. Yeah. And I feel that's exactly what we did. We recruited fantastic people. Um, but as you say, many of those people had to make that tough choice about giving up a role in an organization where perhaps you know they could have spent the next 10, 15 years of their lives versus coming and joining um, an Olympic organizing committee and knowing that the one thing that was guaranteed uh, at the back end of 2012 is that they were going to get um, a redundancy notice saying, you know, thank you for all your yeah. hard work, but your, lo- your role no longer exists. Um, the, uh, and I, I have to say, we were very fortunate in that um, we had many good people who um, raised their hands and said, yeah, we're prepared to take that on. I think some people made that decision because um, they felt that uh, it was something that would never come around again mm-hmm. in their lifetime. So um, um, let's let, let's have a go. Um, and um, therefore, we were able to find great people. Um, but w- did we find that also some people um, uh, shied away from the opportunity? Absolutely. And for understandable reasons. Um, I'm also delighted to say that those people who did join us um, after the games moved on to um, great roles and uh, and are doing now doing incredibly well. So we have people who joined other sports organisations, for example, the uh, the 2015 Rugby World Cup. Some people went to that. Some people went to the Commonwealth Games in Glasgow, and so on. Um, but they've all done really well. I'm particularly proud of that. I'm proud of the team. And I was going to ask how they moved on in their careers afterwards. So you, it sounds like you would, if anybody has the opportunity to do, this, do the same in their home country, you would recommend that they jump at the chance. Yes, absolutely. And in Brazil, Brazil really did um, want to use Brazilian nationals yeah. um, in their organizing committee. So when I went out to Rio uh, to meet with the organizing committee, and, and 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 understand their aspirations, and help in the recruitment of um, my counterpart uh, for Rio. Um, high on their list was having um, Brazilian nationals, and uh, largely that's what they did. They, uh, they used a Brazilian group. They did bring some contract support in from my side, but uh, you'll see the Brazilian team is really populated by Brazilian nationals, right. and that's a good. I think that's a good thing. Yeah, one of the things I wanted to talk about, and it's actually, you know, it was a, a big theme of the um, opening ceremony in Rio was about sustainability and the environment and uh, kind of our role in protecting our planet. And, you know, I think back to Singapore 2005. And for those, you know, outside the UK, that was when um, London was awarded the Games. And, you know, I can still vividly remember the pitch from Lord Coe when he's talking about legacy and the Games will be all about legacy. What role did sustainability play there for us, given that it was such a key theme in the bid, um, as you were bringing on suppliers, as you were thinking about materials to use, you know, basically in everything you did as a procurement function? Uh, sustainability played a massive role right. in, uh, in what we did. Um, so every uh, tender process that we ran, uh, there was a sustainability section in the tenders that we, uh, that we published when those tenders came back, um, they were evaluated by a team of people. We had a representative from sustainability uh, department um, go through the tender responses and evaluate the sustainability of that tender response against uh, uh, certain um, scores that we set out uh, for each question. And so therefore, every tender process that we uh, that we went through mm-hmm. involved sustainability and sustainability evaluation. And indeed, you know, the whole sustainability uh, dash and diversity and inclusion uh, process, you know, it was tough. It was tough to get through. And indeed, uh, in some cases, uh, suppliers were um, were unsuccessful because of the sustainability or diversity and inclusion scores. And uh, um, we were very, very insistent on those areas not being poor relations, i.e., for example, is price the determinant here? Is price right. going to determine it? Absolutely not. Um, if you got a, a great price score but your sustainability was poor, then the chances of you winning a tender would be very, very low um, or, or, or negligible. So um, sustainability is very, very important. Um, we were very clear. We, uh, we 
published the sustainability code uh, that was all online and um, we also worked um, with a body in London um, whose responsibility was was to monitor uh, right. how we did versus sustainability so um um, there are people in there to keep the checks and balances in place, um, and I'm delighted with um, with how people stepped up to that. And again, most importantly, uh, that came from the top down. So at the board and chief executive level and the board of directors, they supported uh, the whole sustainability agenda. Uh, there was nobody who was um, not on message. Basically, everybody got it. Everybody understood the importance of it and the importance of walking the talk. And I think that's one of the things that uh, at London uh, we strove to do. Uh, walk the talk, you say you're going to do something, right. do it. Do you think that you'd have had that success if there wasn't the, the mandate from the top? Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> I don't think we'd have had the level of success that we had. I think getting a mandate from the top is absolutely clear. Mm -hmm. Because if you haven't, I think you have to question whether or not your procurement function is um, in step or out of step with the organization. Right. I've always felt that it's important that a procurement is in step with the organization. If you're off there trying to drive your own agenda as a procurement function, I think that's uh, in most cases that will be a mistake. Yes, kind of uh, I think it behoves the absolutely. I think it behoves the procurement director to ensure that his function is um, is working in step with the rest of the organisation. Um, and I, uh, when I joined uh, Locog, uh, and, and indeed prior to joining, the whole agenda around sustainability and diversity inclusion was right up there as being mm. absolutely. Uh, uh, of paramount importance. You mentioned the sustainability evaluation. What were some of the things that you were looking for? Uh, the, the, there are many things that we were looking for, but for example, if you use um, uh, timber products, um, you know, how, what type of forest have they come mm -hmm. from? And if this is this sustainable? That would just be one example. If I look around the area of um, uh, of people engagement. Um, have the uh, are the premises that uh, our suppliers are using? Are, is it demonstrable that they've incorporated um, um, the correct requirements around uh, diversity and inclusion? Um, and and is this sustainable? So, for example, in one situation, we had a um, a, a supplier a bid for business who um, submitted a very very um, uh, high quality tender but when we visited the premises we find that those premises just wouldn't uh, support um, a diversity inclusion agenda or a diversity inclusion agenda for mm -hmm. example um, for disabled people the access was at the back of the building and we said that would be not not be acceptable to us you know you put the access at the front of the building um, where everyone else was entering the building that's the only way that we would uh, that we would uh, support a tender from that supplier. Um, so these were um, issues that were um, were high on our agenda. And I think also, as most procurement people will um, will attest to, um, we also find it was important to trust but verify. So yeah. we spent a lot of time going out there and looking at suppliers' premises to make sure that everything was in order. So sustainability for us, uh, it was really, really important that... Uh, that we were adopting the very, very best standards. And that's the types of concrete we were using in buildings and so on. You know, I could give you a long, long list of, of, of items, which... By the sounds of it, very granular. So things like, you know, you mentioned the um, even the facilities of, your, of the suppliers who are bidding. You know, I would never even think of that as something that you would consider as part of um, a CSR policy or a CSR requirement, but going to those lengths kind of shows the commitment that you had to to upholding those th that mission of LOCOG and the mission of the uh, Olympic Games. Yes, absolutely. And again, it is about walking the talk. Yeah. If you say you're going to do something, you should do it. And uh, and I felt that the LOCOG organisation generally uh, that was the mantra that everybody followed. So as I wrap up, first of all, I want to, what I wanted to do was, um, you know, talk a little bit about lo the legacy of the work of your team. Um, and there was a quote that I picked out. I'm going to read out the quote from Lord Coe. 
um, and Rodko was the head of Wilcog um, and the games themselves. And he said that the team established a model for procurement that's never previously been done by an organizing committee. By proactively liaising with teams across Lowcog, it revolutionized the way procurement operates. Is, is that the legacy? Is, and has that been carried forward into subsequent games? Yeah, it's uh, very important to say that the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, and the International Paralympic Committee, both those committees um, require organ- uh, the current organizing committee, and in our case, obviously, London, mm-hmm. um, to help prepare the next organizing committee to lay on their games. So, for example, for London, we provided sets of policies, procedures, organization charts, list of suppliers uh, to both Sochi and uh, Brazil, who are going to deliver, the obviously, the, the games now. And so that um, template was provided uh, to Rio and to Sochi, um, not just in terms of a document, both online and a paper document, but also um, local people went over to uh, to Rio uh, to help them prepare and set things up. And so I think uh, a legacy of London is that the documentation that we supplied, I think, is an absolutely first-rate template um, to how to procure for an Olympic Games. Now, of course, there will be certain differences in cultures you mentioned earlier. Yeah. Um, but lots of things will be pretty similar. So, for example, the fact that uh, your venues, uh, typically the specifications, those are going to come through at last minute. That's typically what happens. Right. It's how you deal with that and the processes and procedures you use. And it's really nice to see that uh, certain things that we provided um, to, um, uh, to Rio, as an example, they've absolutely got in place. An example of that would be their deal committee. So uh, we advised them that um, what they should do is set up a deal committee where the um, any expenditure over a certain level, in our case it was £250,000, that deal would come through to a deal committee, which was chaired by the uh, local chief executive. And I sat on that along with the commercial director, along with the legal director and the um, CFO. And the deal would be presented um, not just to look at the, the the price, but more important to look at actually, do you need this service yeah. that we're procuring this item? Procuring as the specification, have you really got the specification right? Have you checked with that? Um, has a com- proper commercial process been followed? And um, that really tightens things up to make sure that everybody understands the the level of rigor that we're going to apply to any deal that we're going to sign. Uh, and therefore de-risks, I think, the deal for any operating com- uh, committee. And I think it did for London. So I think that worked really well. Rio have got that in place. Now, Rio have got other challenges, yeah. uh, just as London had challenges. Yep. But uh, they've got other challenges. But I think the core of what we provided is something they have followed. Yeah, and by the sounds of it, by the, the fact that really with London, it was the first time that procurement really took a strategic role, that you're then able to, through that handover, kind of institutionalized strategic procurement as part of the organizing committee. That's correct. And so then that will hopefully then carry on because now that's the standard from games to games in the future. That's what I would hope, yeah. I think the other thing um, that um, the, the legacy from from London was um, coming in on budget. Yeah. Um, as all procurement seek to do, of course, they seek to drive best value and uh, against the budget that was originally set, the procurement team came in over 100 million under budget. And what that allowed LOCOG to do and the international, uh, sorry, uh, the London Paralympic Games to do is to invest and and um, uh, spend some money in other areas which either A, hadn't been thought of or where they could improve the specification to, to improve the spectacle for the spectators. And I'm particularly proud of that. You know, we are, we helped the organizing committee come in on budget, which right. had been historically a problem. And uh, you'll understand from reading in the media that in previous uh, Olympic committees, they struggled to do that. Yeah. Countries struggled to do that. 
Hence, many people saying, why would you want to bring Olympics to your right. country? Well, London brought them in on on time, on schedule. I think that was something else that I felt um, delighted about. Um, and I think fine, I guess, it's the, uh, the team of people that we brought together. And now that team of people will move out into other organizations not just into Olympic organizations, but other sports events and take a really, really great procurement model into other uh, uh, sports and then back to their own companies if they've moved out of the sports world back into their uh, other corporates. I'm pleased about that. And and so my last question, and this is not related to procurement really, but you know, you you put all the hard work in, I think it was what, a three-year journey. The opening ceremony takes place what are the highlight of the games? What's the highlight of those two weeks? Was it we've done it uh, from a professional perspective or was there something like a moment that you remember that will really stand up as being something that, you know, that, that was the games to you? That was what you'll take away from it? Yeah, I would say um, at the outset of the London Games, we said that for us, the uh, standards that we would apply to the Olympic Games and the Paralympic Games would be exactly the same. Yeah. So that the Paralympic Games, which I think traditionally had been perhaps the poor relation mm-hmm. to the Olympic Games, London said at the outset, that's not going to happen here. And I think for me, the thing that stood out was when the Olympic Games finished, um, there wasn't a sense of, well, it's all over now, guys. We can sit back. Everything's done. Actually, the next day, what you find was that people were back at their desks. Right. People were out in their venues saying, right, okay, so the next step, the Paralympics. And the same standards were being applied, the same rigor, everything. And I felt particularly positive about that. So for me, that moment of, I think it was straight after the Olympic Games had finished, when the next day... Um, we returned to the desks. Um, everybody was just back into work still well, to be we've done. Now got the Paralympics. Yeah, absolutely. There was no sense of um, absolutely it's all done now. Big right. sigh of relief. We can all keep, take it easy. No, nope. the standards were just the same. People were working every bit as hard to lay on the Paralympic Games, and I felt particularly good about that. Well, Jerry, we're running. Um short of time now so I just want to really thank you very much for uh, taking the time to kind of walk me through the journey that you had with London 2012 is particularly relevant right now with the Rio Olympics happening as we speak um, I do want to um, just for for listeners there's an awful lot of um, publications and Jerry you mentioned a couple of them earlier on the um, I forget the actual URL, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to link up to it. There's a lot of um, case studies, best practices, there's policies. A lot of the work that you did uh, in the run-up to London 2012 from a procurement perspective is all there for anybody to go and look at and to learn from and to apply to your businesses. Um, There's really a a wealth of information there, so I'm going to link up to that. Um, And that will be at artofprocurement.com slash olympics, artofprocurement.com slash olympics. So... um, yeah, Joe, with that being said, just thank you very much for your time. I just really appreciate you joining me today and for, as I say, taking me through your journney. It's a pleasure, Phil, and it's good to talk to you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you very much for your time. Thanks. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Art of Procurement. To find an archive of all past episodes, you can go to artofprocurement.com slash episodes. And to ensure you never miss another show, go to artofprocurement.com slash subscribe. Mm-hmm.